Hey guys, welcome back to episode 132 of the Gate Guys podcast. I am Sean Allen here in Chicago. We're going to be online with Ivo out in Dillon, Colorado. This one was recorded uh, sometime around Thanksgiving, so just about a month ago. And uh, we frankly just, uh, I, not we, I ran out of time uh, to get these things um edited and put up uh, just busy time of the year for all of us not only around our homes and, and around the world but uh, also in the clinic and you know my clinic being in Chicago I tend to uh, get a lot of people returning back into town a lot of the college kids and athletes coming back into town and uh, uh, you know it's a good problem to have but plugging up the schedule and having to add another seven eight nine ten hours back into my practice hours sometime during a week when I don't have that so making up plenty of excuses here but uh, the fact of the matter is is that time is short right now at this time of the year and I just got behind but the good news is we've got this podcast and I got two more in the hopper and it is uh, Christmas Eve here I'm going to edit the other one tomorrow on Christmas Day I hope and then we're going to launch that one on Friday for you guys Um, so you're going to have two here in one week and uh, we'll still have one in the hopper for the new year so so on that note uh, apology given hopefully accepted And uh, this is a neat podcast. We're going to be talking about some things that we haven't talked about before. There's been some new research on the timely um, application or um, um, execution of uh, cortisone injections. That there are actually now some research showing when it's a good time to give a cortisone injection and when it's not. One can be beneficial, one can be somewhat detrimental. So we're going to talk about that. Plus a lot of uh, talk on gait retraining and preventing injuries. Um, you know some of the theories of just going out there and going for a run and using your own gait style and form without making any adaptive corrections that might be preventative so we go into that dialogue a little bit and we pull up a study on mice and current day lab studies out of experimental gerontology it is from 2002 but it's done by a very bright man Brett Weinstein I say Weinstein in the podcast and it's Weinstein if you're a Joe Rogan fan you've probably heard him and his brother on Joe's show two very bright brothers he talks about uh, his brother, Eric talks about his brother Brett here on the, uh, the study uh, of this mouse study and why it was kind of glazed over and perhaps why it is very uh, important that for us to look at this and that the mice studies showed that some of these mice have been bred for certain specific studies and if you breed a mice with a bias towards some type of a phenotype or, or a, a telomere type length, you're going to get a... a a result from the study that's going to be based off of that baseline so something you may want to consider and we should all consider when we look at research-based studies uh, and uh, some of the gate studies that are out there are based off of mice you've heard us uh, always joke about our murine population our mice population of gate and uh, jokingly that uh, there may not be a translation over into humans but we know that there is but to what degree nobody knows so we do talk about that study and then we go into depth on arm swing uh, a, t- a favorite topic of mine and I've when I go ahead and peel off or actually rip off a whole bunch of data and some thoughts we go through it rather quickly so if you're kind of new to the gate game you may want to go back and listen to that section because you know I, I in editing this I realized how quickly I did talk through this so um, so that's another good little portion of the podcast and uh, I think that's all we covered on this one Uh, Lots of stuff in between, lots of dialogue. We had some fun. So coming up at the end of the year here, we want to thank you guys for joining us. As always, um, we know that your time is busy. We know that your lives are busy. We hope that uh, the value that we provide in condensing a lot of information and giving you guys what we think is pretty good stuff is of great value to you, and we think that it is. And hopefully in the new year when we put up our Patreon account, you've heard us talking about this, but eventually talk will turn into action. We hope that uh, you guys will be willing to provide a little bit of a donation via paypal or patreon or something like that just to help us make this happen we've got some other projects that we want to get started here and we hope that uh, a little bit of help from you guys because we've never asked for anything hopefully you've noticed that the last 40 or 50 podcasts don't have any sponsors on them so we're taking all of this on our own and the expenses of keeping it up so we hope that you guys might just be willing to add a little bit of a donation just as a thank you so Uh, not asking for it but uh, we're hoping that you would so um, that's it enough of that let's go ahead and get into this podcast and see what uh, see what's new on the gate in the gate world Uh, we're back for another show podcast 132 sean allen here in chicago and on the line is my buddy i have a wear lot and we've got a uh, out there, Dillon, Colorado, actually. Um, you guys must be having snow soon, right? Or snow already? It is snowing as we speak. Oh, 
Oh, lucky you, ski season. It is good. It's always good, although we don't have much snow to speak of yet. Not, not below 10,000 feet, anyway. So do you see a whole brand new slew of different injuries come in as soon as ski season opens up? I mean, it would logically say yes, but um, do you have your same clientele come in uh, that are now skiing? Or do you have a whole bunch of people move into town and a whole bunch of new people you don't know having injuries? A little bit of both. We yeah. get uh, the injuries change with the locals. So we're going transitioning from mountain biking to skiing, although there's snow biking in the winter. So we've got that going on. And then we have a lot of people that only are here for the summer and then those people leave we have a lot of people that are only here for the winter plus we have you know tourists summit county where i live and practice has a year-round population of about twenty-eight thousand, and it swells to four to six times that in the winter time so oh it gets that big i didn't realize it swelled that much oh yeah it's especially during like holiday weeks and stuff like that it's nuts yeah mm-hmm. it's uh it's crazy but uh, that's okay because um, you know that's what we have. So we're we're getting ready. We're enjoying the last few weeks of the shoulder season here, and then um, starting Thanksgiving next week, it picks up and it's pretty much head down until Easter. Ah. So you're probably gonna get a lot of patients coming in who are asking for or who have had corticosteroid injections, as I have in my practice as well. We've got an article here from, uh, it looks like a Eureka Alert, but it's actually an article from Scientific Reports this year, just last month, or no, July of this year. And um, systemic cortis- corticosteroids improve tendon healing when given after early inflammatory phase. Now, you know, prior to this article, you know, there was at least in my mind, and and that shows that uh, I still have a lot of learning to do and probably a lot of our listeners do too, that, you know, there was this, uh, um, and and again, this is just one more piece of the puzzle here, of the truth anyways, but, you know, corticosteroids sometimes help, sometimes don't. Uh, I uh, fondly call my uh, corticosteroid injecting docs in the area needle jockeys. They're really good at what they do. And uh, it's always been about delivering the payload, the Lidocaine corticosteroid right in the area, and the closer you get to the the target, the more effective the corticosteroid. Obviously, if you miss the target by a couple inches, or you're just kind of just shooting into what you think is random, you know, a, a local area, you're not going to get often a, a successful corticosteroid injection result. Um, and uh, so, the better the uh, the needle jockey, the 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 better the the payload delivery to the actual site of origin. And so, I do think that that it had, does bear some. Um, uh, somewhat on the bearing, uh, it has an impact on the bearing of the outcome of the injection. And you, as as we all know, sometimes they help. And there's the the rumors and sometimes factual information out there that steroid injections can degradate cartilage and and uh, they can uh, disrupt the acute inflammatory phase, which might actually slow healing. And we've got an article here that kind of suggests that. Um, what's your take on injections and and uh, something you recommend with your clients? And what do you think of this article? Well, the article is interesting in that I never really thought much about timing of steroid injections. Most of the people we see that have had steroid injections have had them there in the remodeling and maturation phase, you know, of healing. So when you have a ligament injury, okay, not necessarily a muscle injury, but a ligament injury, you have the acute inflammation and reaction phase, you know, which occurs 24 to 48 hours post injury, and you have you know, white blood cells come into the area and local tissue factors causing vasodilation and you get chemotaxis and that kind of stuff. And then from about 48 to 72 hours post-injury to up to four weeks post-injury, we have the repair and regeneration phase um, of the injury where the ligament is actually starting to mature, we're laying down new collagen, et cetera. And then from about, you know, anywhere from... um, two to four, sometimes as much as six um, weeks post-injury up to about 12 months with ligaments, you have the remodeling and maturation phase. So as you know, and as a lot of our readers know, the acute inflammatory response is something which is necessary. We get cytokine signaling, and if we don't, we, sh- we shut down that acute inflammatory response too early, you don't get healing, okay? Uh, the molecular signaling doesn't work, and we have problems. Um, So with this, they're looking at timing, and now it's saying here uh, in the one paragraph, they were um, looking at, um, I'm trying to think of where it is here. They're talking about when when they actually did the inflammation. 
And they said um, when the formation of new tendon has started, the inflammation should disappear and um, rebuilding phase. So I'm assuming that's the remodeling and maturation phase, which is mm-hmm. the third phase. So that's a non-acute portion. And um, in my experience clinically in people that have had injections in that, not one injection, but multiple injections, you do get all of the bad effects of steroids. You know, you get in uh, insufficient collagen cross-linking, so you have a weaker scar. You get suppression of the immune response. You get osteoporosis. You get gastric you know, irritation, all of those. But um, I hadn't looked at any studies that looked at that microscopically uh, as to what's going on and when it was given. I'm, I rarely – well, I shouldn't say that. With ligament injuries, I rarely see corticosteroids prescribed at the onset. Um, occasionally with acute discopathies, and you probably do this as well, <clears throat> you'll see people that had just have intractable pain. And a lot of times if you can get them with steroids early, um, their pain is significantly reduced within 24 hours. And then you can work with them from a you know tissue strengthening, improving endurance standpoint then over the next several weeks much earlier, and they're much easier to uh, to work with. Now, again, I didn't look at those people microscopically, so I don't know what's going on on that level. I'm be- judging a lot of what I'm being told with those patients, that particular population of disc patients, what they're telling me, um, you know, like what, what they're feeding back to me or visual analog scales or, or things like that. So I found the study really interesting. Um, as far as that. And what was really interesting is the paragraph that says is when dexamethasone was given during the rebuilding phase, the tissue in the healed Achilles tendon was more than twice as strong as it was in untreated controls. And that's pretty amazing. So um, I think I need to rethink my thinking. Yeah, those are big numbers. When the research, when the research has delayed the, uh, the start of corticosteroid treatment until the rebuilding phase, as you had said, they found the quality of the collagen fibers in the tendon was much higher, and as you said, two times, and that's huge. I, I, I'm having a trying to have a quick look here. Were, were these oral, or was this inject injectable? You know, I, I don't think it said in the article. I don't think it said either, and, and maybe it's and, and I think that's maybe that's a hole in the understanding here. But I, 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 um, I think it. Regardless, we've got you know, we've got to listen to this at least a little bit. It says here is the tendon heals the collagen fibers are initially laid down in a rather disorganized manner in large quantities. The tissue then tissues then mature and as the fibers are organized into bundles that run parallel to each other in the same direction. Um, uh, so this maturation process is hindered by inf- by the inflammation. Very interesting. Yeah, I think I, I need to readjust my thoughts a little bit too here. I mean, you know, things have value. A, a lot, and I always say this in my office, you know, patients will come in, should I do, you know, hot saunas or, you know, steams, showers or, or the new uh, cryotherapy booths? And I said, look, each person is different. Each condition is different. I can't say yes or no. There are things out there that you will find on the internet to support pretty much anything that you any, any rabbit hole you want to go down. Um, and there are plenty of things that will dismiss most of the things that you have. So you really kind of have to do your homework and, 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 and it gets kind of pr- proves the same thing again that um, each case is different. But the more you know, the more accurate at least your information to your client. But there is that unknown factor. So yeah, timing so, is everything. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, real quick, I just pulled the paper up, and it is, just for people that are interested, a free full text on nature.com. Oh, nice. Um, As far as that, um, the study was done in rats, um, as far as that, and it was an injection done locally, and one of the things they're talking about, um, and just, um, just pulled stuff up quickly, it says systemic treatment, however, might have quite different effects from local. So, um... They're talking about the systemic effects of, you know, glucocorticoids and things like that on the immune mm-hmm. system. So anyway, um, interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I mean, if you're in a musculoskeletal practice, this is a, a germane topic for you to kind of dive into because this is a topic that's going to happen several times a week in your office. You know, if a patient isn't responding quickly, should I go get a corticosteroid shot? It's in most people's dialogue. So the more armed you are with the information, 
the more accurate uh, your, your, your explanation to your client. And, you know, if you quote a study like this that says, look, I mean, timing is everything. How long have you had this? Man, you've had this for six months. I mean, you know, maybe that, maybe that window's kind of closed here at this point, and maybe we need to be looking at, you know, tissue remodeling through rehab and appropriate loading responses. So, you know, timing is everything in many aspects of life. And here, once again, we see it. So, so this one's just probably going to be an open dialogue with us, but can gait retraining prevent injuries? And I think I put up a, a video that was not germane to this as well. So I apologize for that, buddy. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, we get this asked all the time. We see it all over the Internet. You know, you've got some injuries. You know, your form is off. You should be doing some gait retraining. And then there's the other side of the population that says, don't worry about your running form. Just go and run and use your natural running form. Just be you. And um, that doesn't work so well. I've been down and watched marathons and half marathons and 5Ks. And a lot of people, that's not going to work. <laughs> I mean, it's clear their form is atrocious. And um, so can it prevent injuries? I don't know. I tend to think so and i lean pretty heavily on the side of if your mechanics are that flawed that you know you can see clearly someone's got some flawed biomechanics and is loading whatever the the uh, the foot too much into pronation they've got valgus knees they've got a huge frontal plane hip deviation um the mechanics are a factor uh, and just leaving the mechanics alone but making some tissue changes through some rehab without changing the form you know it's kind of like i always use the example it's like getting in the car but not bringing the keys with you and putting in the ignition. you got to put the pieces together here. A lot of the times I give clients exercises, and I said, look, this exercise is great. But if I don't take this exercise and teach you how to model that exercise into your gait cycle so you know how to load it and when to load it, then it's useless. And that is gait retraining. So is it preventative? It's certainly palliative and, 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 and restorative from a treatment standpoint. Is it preventative? Well, I mean, let's say you had to make some physical changes in your client and make these changes, and then they go out and they go away for six months. They stop doing their homework. Uh, the old pattern starts to come back because they really didn't uh, ingrain it deep enough, and now their form starts to move back into an adoptive, an adaptive pattern that works for them around the, the weaknesses that uh, have you know, re-exacerbated themselves or represented. Their form can change again. They're going to load an area maybe a little bit more than they should. So does it prevent it? I, I think it does. But, um, you know, where, what's your stance on this? I'm sure it's pretty pretty much right along the line of mine. But uh, what do you have to say on this? And what do you think about the people who, who are naysayers on this? Well, first of all, the fact that you live in Chicago and I've run in your neighborhood, I find it really hard to believe that if you show up at your car without your keys that you couldn't get it started. I thought, <laughs> like, that was a class that you guys took in school about, like, how to hotwire cars and and, um, and and things like that. Um, you know, I, I have to agree with you in some respects um, as far as can it be injury preventative? It can certainly be helpful. Uh, the big thing, you know, that we do is we help people to compensate better or differently because their old compensation pattern broke down and that's why they're in our office because they want to be faster or they're in pain or, or something along those lines. Um, there's also like anecdotal evidence personally, you know, I'm running a race and I've got some person in front of me that has atrocious gait and they have no pain. They are trucking along and they're in front of me, you know, and I consider myself for, you know, an older, uh, graying individual, um, you know, in pretty good shape, um, for what's going on. And it's just like, wow. And I talk with a lot of these people cause I'm like amazed. You know, I'm like, hey, you know, how you doing? How you feeling? You know, how are your knees? Especially if it looks like they have a huge crossover and an enormous valgus angle with no glutes and no hip extension. And oh, yeah, I am. I feel great. And it's just like, wow. You know, if I had mechanics like that, I'd be in the hospital right now. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm starting more and more because unfortunately sometimes, and I'm sure you do this too, and we're all well-meaning as clinicians, we, we want to fix it. You know, we want to make it look better, but sometimes, you know, leave it alone. Um, if, if it is the way it is, they're not having a complaint. Yeah, it looks bad, but they're having no kind of chief complaint. They're happy with their, um, you know, times or their efficiency mechanically. Um, yeah. I mean, sometimes I'll ask, well, we could make you a whole lot more efficient and probably take some time off your race or your ride or, or whichever it is, but Sometimes you got to just say, hmm, all right, that compensation's there. Because, and I've done this, and I'm sure you've done this, 
you sometimes remove, you know, you make them look better and you remove that compensation and all of a sudden now you've got a whole big bag of worms that you're dealing with and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, I wish I hadn't gone down this road. Um, you know, I could have, should have just left this well enough alone. Um, so I, I don't know, you know, I, I think that honestly gate retraining for people with issues can be somewhat injury preventative for a lot of uh, different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can certainly be injury rehabilitative because I can't tell you how many people with, you know, hallux limitus and triple arthrodesis and things like that that we teach to run differently and they're fine. So I think that it can be good. But, you know, injury preventative, and I know you've looked in the literature and I have um, at this, and the studies are like 50 50. You know, some of them are saying, oh, yeah, you know, this this can certainly prevent this or is correlated with less, you know, incidence of X. And mm-hmm. other ones are like, hey, it doesn't matter. You look at like Ben O'Nig's work, you know, and he yeah. always talks about, um, you know, the foot finding it the best path for that body and what might we think might be best um, for that yeah. individual may not. And, and that reminds me, you know, we, we, for everybody listening, it's November 17th. We, we were, did our third Wednesdays on online CE last night, and we were talking about pedograph mapping. And you know, Sean always talks about, you know, asymmetries and stuff. And asymmetry is the rule. It's not the exception. And when you have people that have asymmetries, remember a lot of times those asymmetries are going to be amplified as gait cadence and uh, speed as well as stride length change. Um, so maybe they look way worse when they're running than when they're walking and right. vice versa. You know, or when you they see fatigue. Patient. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the other thing is, Endurance, you know, yeah. and we, we talk about that all the time. If yeah. they hurt at five miles, have them run four, yeah. and then they come in and run their last mile at your office, you know, so you can watch them crumble. Um, and, you know, with cyclists, sometimes that gets, because I've got a lot of guys that do centuries, and it's like, well, it's not till mile 80. Yeah. It's like, well, you're going to do your long ride, and you're going to come in, you're going to do your last 10 in my office, mm-hmm. and then I'm going to make you do another 10, you know, if I need to, so I can see where you're breaking down and how you're breaking down and yeah. and um, and why. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a fine line. Well, it brings up the thought, you know, I always use the example for my golfers. Look at Arnold, Arnold Palmer's swing. He had one of the most atrocious golf swings in the world, but you were not putting any money down against this man. He, he had ingrained that swing pattern, even though it was one of the more uh, um, unconventional. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, eccentric. That's right. Um, unconventional swings, and uh, arguably to some, very ugly and biomechanically inefficient. But you don't bet against Arnie. And uh, you know, there's that saying, uh, at least a loose saying in golf, that uh, you know, you don't bet against the guy with the gorgeous swing who hits a, hits a pretty good ball every once in a while. You. you, you, you you don't. I'm sorry. You bet against him. You don't bet against the guy who's got a swing that is just uglier than all hell. But every shot is straight down the middle consistently every single time. I mean, they've grooved this compensation, which is what we're kind of talking about here. If you've grooved a deep compensation over, you know, months, years, decades, and you make a change to that client, you're going to open up a whole new can of worms because they've figured it out. Uh, we've figured out how to make it work. It doesn't mean it looks pretty. It doesn't mean that's efficient, but it's working. Could you make them more efficient? You could. You know, I like to, and I know you do too, we take that stance often with our clients. Well, it's not a problem now, but in five more years, if we don't fix this, we could have a degenerative compartment on that knee. We could have, you know, a tip posterior attenuation or or, um, insufficiency syndrome in the tip posterior tendon. We could have, you know, displacement or I'm sorry, um, destruction of some of the medial structures on the ankle that might help resist uh, excessive pronation or or what have you and so you know it's one of those well how bad is it and can you make enough adaptive and corrective change that you don't upset the apple cart and their compensation patterns but you're driving them to something that's a little bit more sound it's a bit of a, um, a double-edged sword there and and i will admit fully i tend to try and drive people back into cleaner mechanics and there are, yes, I admit, many times where I am regretful for doing that. I've learned now at least to talk to the client and say, you're in here because you've got a problem. I think it's because of the way you're loading that. And because of the way you're loading it, that is partly why your form looks the way it does. I then say, I'm not going to change your form. I'm going to change the way you load that. And then hopefully over time, the way you load that differently will show up differently in your form, which then becomes a preventative thing. But I always throw out the caveat. Look, 
we can make this 10 times worse, man, because you, I'm going to give you a pattern that is, is about as infantile as, as it comes, whereas you've got a very well-ingrained adult pattern here that it's working for you, but right now it's not working for you. It, you know, it's failing, but last month it wasn't failing. So how far back do we go and how much change do we make before you're starting to recreate a whole new organism here and the way they move and the way they load? It's what makes clinical practice very difficult. And so I think that uh, for, the, for our listeners and, and for in the clinical fields and those who are not in the clinical field, this is what makes this difficult. It's also what makes a good clinician when they understand these parameters and they understand how nuanced this game can get. And I think the more experienced you are, you've got probably, what, five, maybe 10 years more practice experience than I do. The more experienced you are, the better you make those judgment calls, and you learn that maybe a little bit now isn't a bad thing, and we'll see how you do. Whereas, you know, I think we all did this early on in practice. You go for the, you know, the home run pitch instead of just trying to get on base. Um, you pretty much have the same thoughts on that? I do. A lot of times less is more. Yeah, it really is. It's like uh, playing base, you know? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, but sometimes, you know, you know, more is more, but, you know, you, you've got to know when you're, you know, this comes down to that risk reward ratio and uh, you've got to decide and your client needs to be part of that process because they've come to you with a big trust factor. And so if you're willing to take a, you know, swing for the big pitches, they've got to be willing to accept that there's going to be some strikeouts too. And uh, you might get hit by the odd pitch too. So you're going to have to just be careful, but, you know, inform your client of, of and let them be part of the decision process because frankly, most clients just want to be out of pain. They don't want to come in and get the whole, you know, the whole kit and caboodle overhauled and making some major changes. Um, you know, use that in the off season when they don't have so many miles on the system because for a lot of people, they just want to meet their goal, which might be a half marathon or a marathon or a 5K or just a weekend run with the local run, run group. And uh, you make some major changes, and now they've got to ingrain a whole bunch of new form things with their running form. And, you know, if you make these changes and you've got this homework for the – for the medial ankle and then we're going to do some running form changes and you've got some homework and uh, I've got some running patterns and walking patterns I need to re-ingrain it. It can become overwhelming for a client and I've learned this that often as you said less is more. So but you do get those odd clients that are triathletes and world-class folks. I get them in my office. I know you do too and these folks they're looking for as best the best biomechanical um presentation that they can get because efficiency and power leaks are not acceptable to them uh, or inefficiency and power leaks are not acceptable so you know it really does come down to the client as well so that's what makes this game hard there's just so many layers and levels to it and uh, that's why you got to ask your client what are you looking for here you're looking better better you're looking to run pain-free tomorrow or you're looking better more to run pain-free for the next 50 years so it might change your perspective a little bit in your prescription and the mindset of the professional athletes and paraprofessional athletes is way different. Um, yeah. And you have to be really careful because remember that whenever we induce pain in a any kind of a motion pattern or movement pattern, you're going to get inhibition of the muscles which cross that joint, just like inflammation of that joint. So a lot of professional athletes are going to work through it. They're going to be like, well, you know, I've got to do this and I'm just going to hammer it out and, and that's just the way it is. And sometimes that's not a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. um, as far as that, and it's like, all right, the risk reward ratio, it's sort of like short term gain, long term loss. So it, it's being really careful and really emphasizing like, look, this needs to be a pain free range for you. Discomfort is different than pain. You know, after you work out, after you've done your homework, after your training, it's normal to be uncomfortable a lot of times, particularly in muscle groups if you're working them. Having pain, you know, during the activity, or following that that becomes a problem yeah um and and you know with those professional athletes i mean you know i i see these people sean and i know you do too i had this gal come in to see me she was running the leadville 100 so it's a big long it's a hundred mile foot race um through the mountains here i i forget how many feet i want to say twenty thousand feet of elevation gain it's it's nuts so people come out and do it and i had a gal that had come out um two weeks for because a lot of people, times people will come out Leadville, Colorado, incidentally, is the highest incorporated town in Colorado. It's over, or incorporated city it is, I think. Um, it's over 10,000, it's like 10,200 feet. And that's the base elevation there. I um, mean, people will come out a few weeks before to train. And, you know, I had a gal come in and she had a raging Achilles tendonitis. 
And this was like four days before the race. She goes, well, I, I need to be able to run. And, you know, you can either help me or not, but I'm, but I'm running the race. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're kind of like, all right, well, you could like really trash this thing. And we actually ended up modifying her existing orthotics extremely radically. Um, she finished the race. She came in the day after and thanked me. Um, she ran, you know, in some discomfort, but a lot less pain. And she was super happy. And I emphasized um, that, look, you need to follow up and get this taken care of. I could, actually, I think she was from your area uh, mm. somewhere, uh, Chicago, uh, Chicago land. But anyway, um, you just see these high level people and it's just that's that's their thing. And that's what that's what they do. And that's their mindset. And they can be really easy people to work with because you could tell them to go home, stand on their head and, you know, wrap their feet in cabbage um, and they'll do it because it's like, all right, whatever it's going to take, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, and that's really good from the dedication standpoint. But um, sometimes, you know, it, it can get a little out of hand. Well, it's really amazing that patients get better at all, you know, and it's, there's just so many variables, age and, and, and timing and season and volume of, of their activity and, you know, their motivation levels and their training intensity and the training duration. And then, then you get down to the me mechanical things and the compensations and the synergistic patterns. And then you throw in a whole bunch of different modalities and it's, it's, Sometimes it's just a miracle people get better, <laughs> especially the ones like you had said who who can't afford to stop training. Look, I've got a goal here. I need to make worlds. I need to make the Olympic team. Um, not training is not part of this protocol. If you say I need to stop running, I need to stop skiing, I need to stop biking or swimming, I need to find another doctor. So either help me find a way, or I will find someone else who will. So. As those dialogues got stronger and stronger into the years of practice, I realized that no is not a acceptable answer. It's how. How are we going to do this? We need to become a team and figure out how to modulate some things and modify some things so that we can get around this. And But just telling people to stop who are highly motivated, it works for some clients. And there are some people that are happy for you to tell them, I don't want you doing anything. You know, as you say, it's the beer and Doritos diet. I want you to sit on your keister for three weeks and just do this band exercise. Okay. Now, likelihood that's going to work is pretty slim. You need to load this area, and we need to be doing more than that. But most clients, um, it's a little bit more complicated, and they don't want to – well, they probably do want beer and Doritos, but that's not part of the training program. So, Right, especially if they're, uh, they're gluten-free, you know. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Hey, recently um, on a Joe Rogan's podcast, yeah, yeah, I know. I listen to Joe Rogan a lot. Um, he you had, do, more than anybody that I know. Yeah, well, I never miss a show. <laughs> <laughs> this is, he is pretty much why we started podcasting. In fact, we started podcasting before Joe did, I think. And then, um, it, then he started in and we got back into it. I think we did, what, seven manual medicine advisor podcasts before we kind of drifted off away from that. And then I reached out to you one day and said, you know, I think this podcasting thing, this was, I don't know, six years ago, this yeah. podcasting thing is going to take off. We need to be on this thing. And, and uh, you know, massive numbers since then, uh, we, we, it was a right decision. But um, on Joe's podcast, he had on, I think it was Brett Weinstein or Eric Weinstein. And his brother is a researcher. It's either Brett or, well, I can tell you right now, uh, it's, Brett was the guy that was on. His brother is Eric Weinstein, who is a researcher. It was Joe Rogan podcast 1022 and he mentioned an article that his brother Brett had uh, a journal article in experimental gerontology 2002 and I had never heard of it but his brother was saying you know this guy was having some problems with all these uh, universities and having uh, free speech and whatnot and his brother was standing up for some things and uh, anyways his brother left the job sued the school it was successful allegedly and um, his brother Eric was, or uh, brother Brett was saying that his brother Eric, the researcher, was brilliant. And he, and he, then he said, "Look, there's studies most people don't even know about that are, are, are landmark." And this was one of them. It was the reserve capacity hypothesis, evolution, evolutionary origins, and modern implications of the trade-off between tumor suppression and tissue repair. All right, why are you guys reading us an article from Experimental Gerontology from 2002? I just thought this was really interesting and I thought I would throw it out there. Those who watched or listened to Joe's podcast probably heard it, maybe dismissed it, but I have two brothers who are deep into research, one at Harvard and one in the private industry uh, in uh, you know, en 
in genetic engineering, human engineering, uh, biotech, drugs, and everything. And this was a, a an article on antagonistic pleiotropy, which is the evolutionary process of senescence. And uh, this article, at the very end, they observed that these mice had been bred. And so think about it. Most of these drug studies that are out there, um, and I'm going to need your, some help interpreting this study because it was rather dense and I'm... <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't up my alley because, again, another darn rodent study. But um, a lot of drug companies use these rats for testing the efficiency and, and the half-life and whatnot of, of these drugs. And if you think about it, they breed these mice, these rodents. So what if they bred them to become super engineered, if you will, to either be very sensitive to a drug or to be very resistant to a drug? the results of that study are going to be skewed then. Now, what did this study said, uh, say, excuse me? What would, did you, you got to this, obviously. What, what was the... Yeah, so th the bottom line is when we're looking at rodents and they're bred for scientific experiments or, you know, whether you like that, you know, or not, or you believe that they should be checked on that, what happens is these protocols are designed to increase breeding capacity. In other words, you know, we, we want to engineer them. We want to select out the ones that breed faster so we have more rats that we can test and, and those sorts of things. And that's kind of good. But what they're suggesting in the article here is that when you increase reproductive output, you select against reproductive senescence. In other words, decline of reproductive abilities, and which may be how people or rats are supposed to be. And what you're doing is you're sign of like you're talking about genetically engineering by selection, not like by genetic manipulation in their genome, mm -hmm. to select against this. And what they found in these rats is their telomeres, you know, which are markers of aging. Telomeres are these things, you know, on your ends of your DNA, um, the ends of your chromosomes, that each time you reproduce, or each time that cell, sorry, not you, each time the cell reproduces, a little piece of that uh, telomere comes off. It's called like the alpha four section or something like that. Um, and what happens over time is, you know, you take off a base pair here, a base pair there. They start to become shortened and a little ragged, kind of like the ends of your shelaces if you lose those caps. So what they found in these particular mice is that their telomeres were long, like longer than they should be as far as that. And they're suggesting that you're selecting against um, – you're selecting against what might have been normal senescence. And – Therefore, the results may be skewed in one direction or the other because you're genetically selecting what's going on. You're not looking at natural selection. So it really was quite uh, ingenious uh, looking at it this way. And, you know, yeah, like read through the abstract. There's a lot of language in there. But if you read it through two or three times, it's like, oh, yeah, that like that makes total sense. You know, and that's something that I know until you sent me this article to look at. And I'm assuming you sent it because, you know, I do telomere stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. You know, that's I'd never thought about that, but that is interesting. And and there are maybe instances that you want to select against mm -hmm. reproductive senescence and you want longer telomeres because it, you know, theoretically can increase lifespan and, and things like that. Um, and that could be maybe a good thing. But when we're doing research, <laughs> maybe that's not such a good thing because that's not how it's going to affect the average bear. Right. Yeah, or that, uh, mouse in this case. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, and so that if that one thing, the increased length of the telomere, I mean, what does that mean for the expression of other things on that, you know, for for this, for this mouse? I mean, are, does that make them less likely to express cancer tumors? Does that make them more likely to suppress or, or express cancer tumors? Uh, you know, our first study today on, on corticosteroids was on a mouse study. You know, so they've obviously been part of this, you know, genetic engineering to create these lab mice. And I'm sure they're trying to make it consistent, but that's not the way the world works. I mean, we don't have consistent genes and, and, and expression of these things out in the real world. So, you know, you've got to be real careful with these studies. And a lot of them, unfortunately, they, they use them on animals at the beginning, whatever drug that is, whether it's ibuprofen, whether that's Tylenol, whether that's uh, blood pressure medication, whether that's cholesterol, statins, and everything else. So uh, diabetic-type uh, medications and, and, and whatnot. So you need to think about that when you're reading these studies that even if it looks like a good study, there's some biases in there. And it's hard not to have them as such because it's not a perfect experiment, you know, unless we have two cloned human beings and we're doing side-by-side -side studies. But I just thought it was interesting. And I never, like you said, I'd never thought about this. 
I sent it over to both of my brothers and I kind of got the, uh, I don't know if it was a jaundiced eye or a elevated eyebrow response by email. They were kind of muted, but my both of my brothers are very, uh, very guarded in in what they read. Um, I, I'm sure they've been, you know, tainted and biased and whatnot from the volumes of stuff that they read. But yeah, no, I know I did get the hmm, that's interesting from them. Never thought about it from that perspective, and I think that's the only reason why I put this in here is, you know, we try to be as honest and pure with this process and and try to reduce the biases and this is certainly another way to at least look at it so you know it, it's interesting that you put this in here and, and this is getting off gate a little bit that's okay. but i'm going to mention it anyway i was listening to chris Cresser um the other day i listened to him quite a bit yeah. does a lot of neat nutrition stuff well i was listening to a methylation podcast mm-hmm. that he was talking about and he was actually interviewing amy yasko and i don't know if you know mm-hmm. amy yasko but she is to methylation like uh you know jacqueline perry is to gate i mean she is mrs methylation if she's married or ms methylation anyway <laughs> they were talking about treatment for meth- common methylation defects mthfr defects and snips and stuff like that and they were talking about how the, a lot of people, um, and hopefully I'm not misquoting them, but they're, you know, because it's like the latest thing now. Oh, you have the MTHFR, you know, you need all these methyl donors are being over treated. And when you're giving these people all these um, methyl donors and um, methylation promoters, what actually happens is it shuts down certain promoter regions of the gene and it actually is creating pathology. Um, which is kind of like, you know, what's happening here. Um, with Through breeding, we are, you know, performing natural selection and who knows genetically, like, what's going on with those particular rats. So mm-hmm. anyway, interesting stuff. Methylation, of course, has a lot to do with repair of your DNA. And that's, uh, you know, in this particular article, they're talking about tumor suppression and tumor repair. And they talked a lot about those promoter regions and stuff in the podcast. It's pretty cool um, if you just go on to iTunes and you search Chris Kresser and you can look. I was looking specifically for an, um, a podcast on methylation. And I ran across this one. I listen to a lot of um, Chris Masterjohn, who I think I've shared with you before. He's a really geeky PhD chemist guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, I listened to his methylation one, which was really great, but it took me a really, really long time to get through it because it's very dense. Um, well, Chris uh, is a little bit more cut to the chase, you know. He is. He is. <laughs> and, and um, you know, I guess we're, we're initiating another drink. Uh, if you were drinking with certain words that we... We repeat often. Uh, Joe Rogan Experience Podcast, number 1037, Chris Kresser. Three hours of absolutely gorgeous information on health. He did it just, what, a week ago. And it was, again, this is the second time on Joe's podcast. Talk about hitting home runs. I mean, if you're looking at gut health and gut biome and all of these diseases from hypercholesterolemia to blood pressure problems to diabetes, this podcast knocked it out of the park. And so it's another three-hour podcast, number ten. 37 chris kresser with joe rogan can't can't recommend it more so there's another excellent one for you. there's another one hey. for you it was just perfect it was great job so anyways arm swing you want to talk about arm swing i'm going to let you go first and i'll jump in with my piece after because you are mr arm swing on the blog so well you know i wouldn't say that i'm mr arm swing you and i are you know we put a lot of these things together and uh, we've written a lot of things together over time and we recently i think within two or three months did an arm swing podcast over on online CE uh, every Wednesday, every third Wednesday, excuse me. And um, we put some uh, recently some studies up on social media and on the blog on arm swing and looking how arm swing could influence the lumbar spine and hip forces and motions during walking. And uh, yet again, I mean, they were looking at the, the range of motion of the thorax with respect to the pelvis and of the pelvis, pelvis, (laughs) pelvis, uh, with respect to the ground in the transverse plane were significantly associated with arm position and swing amplitude during gait. So I'll read the rest of this. The hip external internal rotation range of motion statistically varied only for non-dominant limbs. Unlike hip hip joint reaction forces predicted peak spinal loads of at T12, L1, and L5, S1, those transitional areas, showed significant differences at approximately the time of contralateral toe-off and contralateral heel strike. Bottom line, if you're looking at arm swing, you're probably looking at scapular motion. If you're looking at that, you have to be looking at thoracic rotation and your ability of your client to have adequate amounts of thoracic extension because those are coupled. If you're looking at that, you're probably looking at thoracic 
rotation and the phasic or antiphasic nature or relationship with the pelvis rotation. And uh, because the longer the stride, the faster you go, um, and if you're particularly in no pain, uh, the, the rotation of the thoracic interval and the pelvic interval moving in opposite directions to increase stride length and increase arm swing uh, should occur. Uh, a couple years ago, we quoted the Stu McGill study. This is nothing new that for those folks who've been with us for a while, but there's lots of new people each week. A couple hundred new people each week join us here on The Gate Guys. And, you know, the Stu McGill study from eons ago showed that clients who have spinal pain tend to reduce the differential between thoracic rotation and pelvis rotation. So in other words, they tend to move more in phase. So um, there's less of that rotation through the thoracolumbar area. And so pain tends to, and that's because the more rotation you have, the more spinal compression you have on the motor units, which can generate more pain. So trying to reduce the compression through the vertebral bodies and the facet joints will occur if you reduce the amount of rotation. So moving slower with smaller steps, that's why those people tend to walk that way because they're in pain and they're trying to reduce the amount of spinal compression and loading. So, and, and obviously shear as well. So this was just another study. And I think you then followed it up with another one as well. Um, showing that um, the arms are like a ballast and many times uh, they're used to uh, help us with balance, help us with postural equilibrium, but um, they're also there to help us with locomotion. And when you've got an asymmetry or you're running with a water bottle in your hand or you're walking to work with a briefcase or a purse or you've got a purse on your shoulder or a handbag or something like that or a, a messenger bag, you're impairing some of the natural processes of arm swing, scapular motion, thoracic rotation, uh, by elevating that shoulder, by changing the weight in that hand. And it causes some adaptive changes. We do it all the time in clients who have, for example, right osteoarthritis of the hip. You know, the last thing you want is more glute medius contraction across that right hip because glute medius contraction is perpendicular to the joint line. And so the more you compress and contract that glute medius, the more compression across a painful degenerative hip. This is why you get a Trendelenburg gait. Uh, they're trying to unload it. And so what you can do is modify the weight bearing load either on one hand to help them make that glute medius work. But if you're trying to get them to shut it down, you put a weight in their hand. Since we're talking about a right hip, you put them, have them put their purse or a bag, or if they're doing some gait retraining in your office, have them put the weight in the right hand. So now they can actually just use the weight as a counter force, teeter totter type effect that pulls them up and over the hip instead of compressing them up over the hip. So arm swing matters. That's kind of the gist of this whole thing. And understanding what arm swing means in your client is huge. It's also why you shouldn't be coaching arm swing unless you really know what's going on because there's plenty of studies, and this was just another one that su suggests strongly that arm swing is a secondary motion. It occurs as a result of what's happening elsewhere in the body. It's adaptive. When you've got frontal plane sway, you get arm abduction on the opposite arm a lot of the times to try and balance out the body because they're shifting too far in one direction. It's a counterweight or a ballast, as I said. So arm swing a lot of the times is adaptive. And if you're coaching a change in your client's arm swing without figuring out why that arm swing is aberrant, you're probably coaching out an adaptive response and coaching in a new one. So as we like to say, you're adding a compensation to a compensation to a biomechanical limitation. And that's the last thing that you want. The floor is yours. <laughs> you know, I think you pretty much summed it up. My article was talking a little bit more about the anatomy of the lat and its connection with the contralateral lower extremity and how that hole, as it's called in some circles, you know, the posterior oblique um, sling. sling. Yeah. So um, basically the um, lat, the glute, and the uh, contralateral glute max, sorry mm -hmm. about that, yeah. um, are all connected here. And... The only thing I would add is that the lat activity, lat generally doesn't fire during gait in an ideal situation. When it does fire, then we are starting to see um, gait pathology, and it will only be recruited at higher um, gait speed. So as speed increases, the lat becomes more, and that's the gist of the study you were talking about as well, linking that. So the studies that I had cited were 
predominantly looking at like Art Fleming's early work and the thoracolumbar fascia being the functional link, and then also that increased gluteal activity on one side. You know, one's going to um, affect the other, but it's G max, not G med, which creates extension of the hip rather than compression and abduction and external rotation of the hip. So, um, but basically, we just said the same thing differently. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that, that brings up a thought. And uh, I had a, uh, a coach in the other day with a very well read and knowledgeable coach in the other day. Um, actually, the other week. It wasn't this, it wasn't this week. With one of his um, runners. And um, Mike, that's not you in case you're listening because I know you're probably thinking it's you. Um, and he was asking this question. You know, it was clear that the client both symptomatically had some arm problems and some contralateral hip problems. And he asked the question and I thought it was just very well, well put. And, and it told me how much this person either followed our work or was thinking independently on their own. But regardless, I applauded him and he asked the question, what would happen if you fix the arm first or the shoulder or the arm swing first? You know, would you get a reciprocal change in the opposite hip? And I stopped and I said, well, absolutely. You could. It's a good question. Uh, is it possible you might not get the response you want? It always is, absolutely. Um, he said, because you always go after the hip first. And I said, well, I do, because it, it seems to be a larger group. It's more um, postural and phasic in running. Um, you can run without much arm swing. And so it, it, I just thought it was an interesting question. And he, And then he said, well, do you always fix both? Do you sometimes leave the shoulder alone and just work on the hip and see what adaptive changes come out of the arm, uh, the scapulothoracic glenohumeral interval? And um, and I said, yeah, it really is. One, sometimes it's just dependent on how much time I have with the client. And two, sometimes it depends on which one's more symptomatic because, frankly, your client wants to go out of there with the major problem addressed, not the minor. Um, it just brought a whole bunch of thoughts to my mind of, well, you know, we tend to get into these rhythms of doing what we do because that's what works for the majority. And only when you get these anomalies do you deviate from your, your game plan. Um, I tend to usually, if I have time, address both of them and try to bring together a loading response that brings in that chain that you were talking about, that posterior oblique sling, because there are many dynamic motions that will bring both of them in there because it's just a natural movement in sport. But there are times when I leave it alone. And it was just a very interesting question because it, it it was a very complicated question. And I said, look, it depends, which is what I always say, because it really does depend. You know, does this client have enough thoracic rotation and enough core engagement in order to get a antiphasic response that would allow me to get them to couple that hip with the contralateral shoulder? Because sometimes you just have to get the hip more stable before you move into normal pelvic motions, before you move into lumbar stabilization rehab, uh, before you get into thoracic rotation and extension and stabilization and breathing patterns and rib cage descent and primary movement patterns based off of DNS or whatever system that you use before you can get to the shoulder loading response. So it's very complicated. And if I just complicated it for some of the folks who, who are really kind of low on the chain of education or experience with this stuff and are kind of new, if it sounds like we're trying to overcomplicate this, I, I am not. By any means, I am not. But the fact of the matter is it is complicated. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't seem complicated because you just basically breathe on your client and tell them to do this one exercise. They come in and you look like a miracle worker. But a lot of the times the answer to that is, oh, you weren't in that much trouble. You know, we barely needed to add anything before you could actually just start figuring out how to adapt around this and compensate to unload the tissue to get a p positive response. It doesn't mean your problem is gone. It just means you've got enough protection now to get around the loading response without it becoming painful. You may go back and in a week, you may have pain again. You know, there's that threshold. How far off the threshold of the tissue tolerance have you taken your client? Um, this is, these are the clients Well, I have good for three days and then I had two bad days and then I had another good day and then I had three bad days in a row and then I did four really good days. So how am I doing doc? I'm like, I guess you're kind of close to that threshold where we're awfully close. We've either got the recipe right or you're not that bad. Um, again, that kind of goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning here that this game is complicated and sometimes you're just darn lucky to get a client better. And sometimes just teaching them how to load differently is the answer to get your client out of pain, but it doesn't mean that's the answer to fix their problem. So, 
sorry about that. Went down a little rabbit hole there. Um, what are your thoughts? Anything to add to that? You know, my, uh, I think you put it well. Um, when people come in with those problems with one limb and the contralateral limb, you know, either upper or lower is having the issue, I always ask which one was first. Very good and, question. Yeah. And then once I know which one is first, that's usually the one that I'm going to make sure that I spend mm-hmm. most of my primary treatment on. Now, it's really hard to convince somebody with a hip problem that it's their opposite shoulder. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, you'd look at like I, you know, had a dude in today that had a, a broken clavicle on one side with, thankfully, he had had it plated, you know, because we see so many people that where they allow the overlap to occur. Um, but you know, you just, you'll, you'll look at that and you're like, wow, this is going to be creating problems down the road, not only with their neck and shoulder mechanism, but that opposite hip down below and maybe even the ipsilateral hip if the opposite hip starts to go south and, um, and things like that. And it's, it's just, it's convincing those individuals, um, with that or conversely, you have somebody with a shoulder problem and you're trying to explain to them it's their hip and lower back or, you know, something in the lower kinetic chain on the opposite side. Um, that's actually driving the bus. And usually if you can show them something like you, you know, use a varus wedge and invert their foot and that externally rotates their shoulder on the contralateral side enough, you know, because of the change in the pelvis that their shoulder gets a percentage better or they have this increased function all of a sudden in the office, I think you can get buy-in pretty immediately and you can go about it. But it's a long, it's a long road to hoe otherwise. And it's a lot of education and a lot of talking to people about compensations and explaining biomechanics and, and what's going on. And people, even after you do all that, are still fairly skeptical. You know, they are convinced that it's my knee and my – you really, there's something wrong with my knee. It couldn't be my hip. It couldn't be my ankle. You know, it couldn't be my shoulder. It, it's my knee. That's what the problem is. The MRI, look, you know, here's the MRI. It shows that I – you know, and it's kind of breaking through that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it really comes down to show me the money. And uh, if you if you if you can show them the money at the end of the treatment that you made a response, even though you weren't locally where they were having pain, they will have buy in. And sometimes you got to say, look, just do this for two weeks. If I can't show you the money, I promise I'll go back down into that area and add some more stability so that you feel like we're getting a, a positive change in the loading response down there. But we still need to fix this shoulder. But uh, I'm I'm big on analogies in my practice. I know you are too. And one I like to use is. You know, when someone comes in, for example, with knee pain, and sorry for those folks, I think it's been it's been many podcasts since I think I use this bad example, but it really does work. I have two brothers, and whenever you put three brothers in the back seat of the car, and the one in the middle starts screaming, the smart parent looks at the two innocent ones looking out the window with the bloody elbows, and so just because the knee is between a a a, a hip and a foot doesn't mean the knee is the problem, even though it's the one screaming. You know, you've got a, a single planar a hinging knee joint with one, basically one with a little bit of rotation, yeah, um, of cardinal planes of motion, but you've got a multi-axial hip above and a multi-axial foot below. There's some tolerance and some accommodate, or some some tolerance to adaptability at the hip and the foot that the knee doesn't have. The knee is just looking for sagittal motion most of the time and trying to say, you're moving forward, I want to bend forward and hinge forward. But when you've got a hip that maybe is carrying you off into the frontal plane and then the foot is having to rotate uh, into internal rotation or pronate more to try and make up for that adaptive uh, negative response. The knee gets carried inwards in too much rotation and it starts to bark. Does that mean you change the knee? It's just getting caught in between those two bloody elbows of the guys sitting in the car. So you really kind of have to understand that explaining stuff to your clients that they understand how they got to that place and that sometimes, like you said, the area that's screaming the loudest isn't necessarily where the problem is. You're just going to have to believe me that we're going to have to fix your shoulder before we can get to this hip, even though your hip is what's causing your, dysfun- your dysfunction. So, um, But it really does come down to show me the money. Whatever stupid examples you use, the bottom line is your patient's going to disappear if you don't get them some results. So you better be pretty certain of your, your obtuse patterns of, uh, and choices of where you're going to initiate care. But uh, if you're good at it and you're right, and you get a response, that client thinks you walk on water and they'll call you a wizard and, you know, buy you a hat and ask you to grow a long beard. So, hmm. yes. Yeah. Being bald, none of my patients ever offer to buy me a hat or grow a long beard. No. So, but no. that's all right. Yeah. And I always say, look, I might not be a wizard, but I might be a magician. So mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. A young client came in and I said, I said, man, I don't know. He, he goes to the University of Notre Dame and he's, 
emailing me about a shoulder problem. I said, dude, I need to see you. I don't have a crystal ball. And he goes, I thought you were a wizard. I said, I'm not a wizard. And he goes, well, maybe you're a magician. I thought, okay, I'll take magician. There you I'll, go. Take, there you I'll go. take magician. <laughs> yeah. All right, man, you got to go get your kids. So um, there you have it, folks. Podcast 132 in the hopper. Done. And uh, I guess you guys will be hearing this one after Thanksgiving. But since it's before and we're going to send that over the ether, all the good wishes and vibes to those folks who do celebrate Thanksgiving here in the Western Hemisphere, at least the United States. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you good folk out there. And um, get out there and run off some of those calories. So I guess that's it. You have anything else to say? I have nothing else to add. Ivo is speechless. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> I'm Sean Allen in Chicago. Thanks for being here. I have a world up deal in Colorado. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time.